Hoe kijkt men in Israël naar de medisch-ethische dilemma's in Nederland? Welkom bij Uitgelicht. Afgelopen jaar is het medisch-ethische debat in Nederland flink opgeleid. Bij ons in de studio is aangeschoven Ricky Vrolig, hoofdverpleegkundig bij Allais. Een Israëlische instelling die hulp geeft aan ernstig meervoudig gehandicapte kinderen. Mrs. Vrolig, welkom. Uh, can you explain briefly what the work of Allais is about? Allais is a home for mentally, severely mentally and physically handicapped children. Mm -hmm. And our aim is to give these children quality of life for as long as they are with us. We have four centers. Um, in the Negev, in Jerusalem, in Bnei Brak, and mm -hmm. in Gdera. Okay, and how many years have you been working there? I've been in Alle for 15 years. 15 years, right. So before we go uh, deeper into the work of Alle, I want to discuss uh, an, a number of medical ethical issues that are actually present right now in the Netherlands. Uh, for example, in the, um, there has been a discussion about abortion, about euthanasia, about donation of organs. How do you, from your uh, profession as a nurse, look at the situation in the Netherlands? Um, it's quite difficult as a nurse um, who's always been taught to help, to give life. Um, we in Israel and in Allah believe in the sanctity of life. I know that a lot of people, it seems to me, in the Netherlands would turn around and say, some of these children are so severely and mentally handicapped. What are you doing with them? Mm -hmm. Why are you doing it? We believe in the sanctity of life. So. For me, it's a difficult subject to, to deal with, euthanasia especially. Yeah. Is it is it really a different situation in Israel, how people are regarding euthanasia, abortion, etc., and if you compare it to the Netherlands? What I, think, is the I think the answer would be yes. Mm -hmm. I think in the Netherlands you've got the Western um, autonomy. A person is autonomous. He has... Uh, he has, he has he's, and in his own life, he can decide what he wants to do in his own life. In Israel, we do have the Jewish ethic, and the Jewish ethic is that we have sanctity of life, and mm -hmm. it's a God-given, um, it's a, it's a God, God gives life and God takes it away. Mm -hmm. And so it is a very different outlook. It's a very different outlook. A few months ago, there was a documentary in, in the Netherlands which was broadcast on uh, national television. It was about a woman suffering from dementia who got euthanized and was filmed during, during this process, and this was also broadcast on television. Um, what would be your opinion about that, about uh, people with dementia who are actually getting euthanized because they uh, said they wanted to already a few years ago? It's a very slippery slope. Mm -hmm. Somebody may have said in the past that they want to be euthanized, but when it actually comes to it, somebody else is making a substituted judgment for them. Mm -hmm. They're turning around and saying, I know what this person would have wanted because he told me so beforehand. Yes. Um, but that can change. And who are we to know that it's changed? And if we just decide, okay, that's what they wanted and now they have dementia, um, then we're basically ending a life. Mm -hmm. I don't think in Israel it would be allowed to be broadcast. <laughs> No, 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 that's right. It was a big a big discussion also in politics uh, in the Netherlands that uh, should it be allowed for people who are at that moment not uh, able to, to, to say what they want if they want to be uh, euthanized. Do you think it is good that politics is involved in this discussion about this ethical border, so to say? I think the politics has to be involved. It has to have legislation. Mm -hmm. There has to be legislation for when it comes to all these issues. Um, there has to be a value system. Mm -hmm. You have to know where you're coming from. Um, if you don't, then anyone can do what they want at all times. Mm -hmm. So there has to be legislation. It mm -hmm. can go one way or the other. But it's a medical, uh, a medical issue, it, so perhaps it is, the but doctors... It's an ethical, and, yeah. But it's an ethical issue. Mm -hmm. It's not just a medical issue. It's an ethical issue and it stems from values. It stems from where we come from. It's, mm -hmm. It stems from who we are. Mm -hmm. um, Israel is a Jewish democratic state has to have a, a position on how on, on what we think of it and mm -hmm. I think so does Holland. Recently the bill, uh, a law was passed in, in Holland in the parliament about uh, a donation of organs that people who are not saying they don't want to donate organs uh, are automatically uh, opting. donating them, opting them. What do you think about that? Would that be possible in Israel? I know there's a legislation that's trying to be put through to opt in as opposed to opt out. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a very different mindset when you, when you have to actually sign to say that you don't want to. It's an active thing that you have to do as opposed to when you have to sign that you mm -hmm. want to. Um, would it ever pass in Israel? 
it is possible, mm -hmm. um, but I think it's a much harder thing to sign. Mm -hmm. Whereas you're opting out, especially with the Jewish medical ethic, when you turn around and you say that life is sacred and it's, a, it's very difficult to decide when life ends. Right, right. And the Bible learns, learns us, you already uh, told us, basic principles that life is sacred and that only God can give or uh, life or take away life. Are these the basics from where you personally do your work? Yes, in LA we work very much um, by the fact that it is life is sacred and we try and do as much as we can for the children at all times mm -hmm. in order to make their life, the quality of life that they live um, well. We, um, I think that you have to say that sometimes when quality of life is so bad mm -hmm. um, that you are allowed to sit back and be passive. Can you explain that? Like maybe uh, by, by an example that you experienced? Um, we have children who suffer from genetic diseases mm -hmm. and we know that genetic diseases are progressive and eventually these children will die from respiratory failure. Mm -hmm. So we do everything until they get to the stage where they can't breathe on their own. So if we need to feed them through a tube in their stomach, we will feed them through a tube in their stomach. Mm -hmm. If we need to put in a cannula to their trachea to, to, the, to help them to breathe, to yeah. help them to get out the, uh, the mucus, then we will do that. But then the question is, do we then put them on a respirator when we decide that they, we know that they have a genetic disease and they, their quality of life will then be diminished. We are allowed at this point to withhold, to not put on a, on a respirator you machine. Mean allowed by law or allowed by the Bible? We are by allowed by faith. the Bible, we are allowed by law not mm -hmm. to put on when they, we already know that they, the law actually in 2005 that was passed um, is the law of the patient who is about to die. Um, it gives two weeks. If you think the patient will die within two weeks, it's mm -hmm. a very difficult decision to make. It's not an easy thing to know if a patient will die in two weeks. But we know that these genetic diseases are degenerative and we know what the prognosis is. Mm -hmm. So in this case, it would probably be easier to decide not to put on a respiratory machine, but to do everything possible to keep that patient comfortable and um, until they do die. But where is this, this, this point where, where the situation changed? Because uh, maybe in some situations you say you want to put a child on a respiratory uh, machine, in other situations not. So wh where is the changing point? How do you know this? It's a very, it's a very difficult decision to make. Mm -hmm. Again, with a genetic disease, mm -hmm. then you'll know that the deterioration is so much that they mm -hmm. will stop breathing. If it's a child just with cerebral palsy who has pneumonia and needs to be put on a respiratory machine to clear that pneumonia and can come off, then you will connect and you won't say no, let them die of pneumonia. We mm -hmm. can treat pneumonia. Mm -hmm. So we would put that child on a respiratory machine with knowledge that we will, their life will be better and we'll be able to take them off. Right. This, uh, these children are severely handicapped children. They don't have any autonomy to decide about uh, yeah. their lives. So who is deciding this for them? And that's always the difficult question. Mm. Um, there is always a, either the parents, the parents are the legal guardians and at the end of the day they are the ones who decide. Mm -hmm. But it's always the question when they live in Alain and the medical staff are taking care of them and we look after them and we see them on a day-to-day -day basis, we also have an opinion. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult to decide who decides um, and every one of us is biased. Yeah. If you every think a, a parent is taking a wrong decision according to your opinion, what would you do? Would you respect that opinion and help the child or what would you do? What we do do, mm -hmm. um, we sit together. We sit together with the parents. We sit together if the parents are religious. We sit together with the rabbis and the parents and we discuss it. Mm -hmm. We bring in an ethicist to sit down and sit with us. At the end of the day, we cannot force the parents to do something that they don't want to do. But mm -hmm. I've, we've never ever had a situation where we thought something should be done and the parents fought us on it to the end. Mm -hmm. We've managed to convince, we've managed to do. We, I think communication is a very big thing between parents and medical right. staff. Right. How is it for you personally to deal with these kind of uh, dilemmas, the medical ethical uh, dilemmas? It's very difficult. It's one of the reasons I went to study medical ethics. Mm -hmm. um, it's not, you never know whether you've made the right decision. Mm -hmm. You hope you've made the right decision, and sometimes we don't. So you have to learn from your mistakes. Can you, you have sleep to. at night? Or do you sometimes keep awake? There are nights that I don't sleep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there are nights that I'll turn around and say, was that the right thing to do? Mm -hmm. Sometimes we've convinced parents to do something, together with the rabbis, together with the ethicists. We've convinced them, and it's turned out to not be the best decision that we've made. Mm. That's when I don't sleep at night. Right. Now, you work in uh, Jerusalem already for 15 years. Yes. Um, and as we know, Israel is not always a very peaceful country. Sometimes there is a war or there is uh, terror attacks. Um, how is this for you? Can you describe what happens, for example, during a war? 
With war two years ago, um, there were rockets flying. And rockets were fired from Gaza? Fired from uh, Gaza, Jerusalem. they were fired to Jerusalem. And before the war started, and we knew it was probably going to be, um, the Home Guard came in to um, see how we could manage with the children. Our children mm -hmm. don't walk, they don't talk, they can't get up by themselves and run into the shelter, they're not capable. So we have to take them physically into the shelter. Mm -hmm. And we have 45 seconds to do that. So well, you have 14, 45 seconds from the moment that the alarm the starts? The alarm starts, to there go are 45 the seconds okay. to get into the shelter, which is on each floor there is a shelter, but that means mm -hmm. you have to get 80 children who don't walk, who are in wheelchairs, and if it's night time and they're in their beds, you have to physically pick them up and move them How in. How do you do that? It's practically impossible. So we had volunteers come in who helped, but what we did eventually when we saw that it was just wasn't possible to do it in 45 mm -hmm. seconds. We moved the children that were on the oxygen and, and needed the medical care into the safe rooms all the time. The other children were moved into the corridors yes. so that we could try as much as we can to get them closer. Um, we didn't always manage to get them all in. Okay, but you actually had to make a choice like this child I will try to save and you had Whoever to was closer and however we managed to do it, but we right. did bring in the volunteers and mm -hmm. um, the parents were aware of what was going on mm -hmm. and they knew. Right. About, because, of course, in Israel, as we know, it's a multicultural uh, society. There is not only Jewish people, but also Muslim, Druze, Christians. Uh, are you, uh, who are you helping in Ale? Ale doesn't, dif doesn't discriminate between anybody. We mm -hmm. have Jewish children, we have Muslim children, we have Christian children, we have from all walks of life. But not only the children, our staff is made mm -hmm. up of a completely multicultural staff. We have, again, Druze w uh, workers, we have Muslim workers, we have Jewish workers, mm -hmm. we have from all, from secular to, it, to doesn't that religious. Give a problem? There is like no it. politics in Allah. We don't allow it. Any politics that goes, goes outside the door. Um, it's not brought in, even during the war, even mm -hmm. during the most terrible terrorist attacks. And mm -hmm. there were quite a lot. You come into work, it's left outside. We have to treat the children. If it's brought into work, the only people who get hurt are the children, mm -hmm. because then the work won't be done properly. Right, right. So politics does not come into it. It's, uh, it's okay, it's not important. What, uh, what or from, from where do you get your happiness and your satisfaction in your work at Ale? I think from seeing the work that's being done. Whatever we give, we get back tenfold. Whatever we do, in when you way? see a smile of a child, when you see that you've managed to help a child, um, even if it's the smallest, smallest thing, you've put in a gastro tube because they couldn't swallow and all of a sudden their quality of life has gotten better. You've taken them out on a field trip, which beforehand nobody else had done because they were so afraid of taking out these children. Mm -hmm. um, but you've done that and they've come back and you can see that they're happy. And most of our children you can tell mm -hmm. when they're smiling, when they're happy. They don't talk, they don't tell you. But you can see there is a, there is a, a vibe to them. There, there's a light, they, they mm -hmm. live. Mm -hmm. And so that gives a lot of satisfaction. Right. And you, you told us uh, in this interview about uh, the Jewish perspective on medical ethical dilemmas. What can we learn in Holland as Christians from this uh, Jewish approach? I think in our Jewish approach, we bring in not only the written law, we bring in also the oral law. Mm -hmm. And when you bring in the oral law, there are other directives that come. And it's not just sanctity of life at all costs, mm -hmm. but it's also quality of life that counts. And so we have to bring in quality of life. Mm -hmm. We're not allowed to actively do anything. Mm -hmm. But there's a time sometimes to sit back and say, this is until here we go. And from here, we make life as comfortable mm -hmm. as possible. Right. I want to thank you for this uh, conversation, uh, Mrs. Vrolich from uh, Allé. Thank you so much. U thuis ook bedankt voor het kijken. Dit was uitgelicht voor vandaag. Graag tot volgende keer.